Chapter 9 of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 9. Why Not Always Have Good Business? The employer has to live by the year. The workman has to live by the year. But both of them, as a rule, work by the week. They get an order or a job when they can and at the price they can. During what is called a prosperous time, orders and jobs are plentiful. During a dull season, they are scarce. Business is always either feasting or fasting, and is always either good or bad. Although there is never a time when everyone has too much of this world's goods, when everyone is too comfortable or too happy, there come periods when we have the astounding spectacle of a world hungry for goods, and an industrial machine hungry for work, and the two, the demand and the means of satisfying it, held apart by a money barrier. Both manufacturing and employment are in and out affairs. Instead of a steady progression, we go ahead by fits and starts, now going too fast, now stopping altogether. When a great many people want to buy, there is said to be a shortage of goods. When nobody wants to buy, there is said to be an overproduction of goods. I know that we have always had a shortage of goods, but I do not believe we have ever had an overproduction. We may have, at a particular time, too much of the wrong kind of goods. That is not overproduction. That is merely headless production. We may also have great stocks of goods at too high prices. That is not overproduction. It is either bad manufacturing or bad financing. Is business good or bad according to the dictates of fate? Must we accept the conditions as inevitable? Business is good or bad as we make it so. The only reason for growing crops, for mining, or for manufacturing is that people may eat, keep warm, have clothing to wear, and articles to use. There is no other possible reason. Yet that reason is forced into the background, and instead we have operations carried on, not to the end of service, but to the end of making money. And this because we have evolved a system of money that, instead of being a convenient medium of exchange, is at times a barrier to exchange. Of this more later. We suffer frequent periods of so-called bad luck only because we manage so badly, if we had a vast crop failure, I can imagine the country going hungry, but I cannot conceive how it is that we tolerate hunger and poverty when they grow solely out of bad management, and especially out of the bad management that is implicit in an unreasoned financial structure. Of course the war upset affairs in this country. It upset the whole world. There would have been no war had management been better, but the war alone is not to blame. The war showed up a great number of the defects of the financial system, but more than anything else, it showed how insecure is business supported only by a money foundation. I do not know whether bad business is the result of bad financial methods, or whether the wrong motive in business created bad financial methods. But I do know that, while it would be wholly undesirable to try to overturn the present financial system, it is wholly desirable to reshape business on the basis of service. Then a better financial system will have to come. The present system will drop out because it will have no reason for being. The process will have to be a gradual one. The start toward the stabilization of his own affairs may be made by anyone. One cannot achieve perfect results acting alone, but as the example begins to sink in, there will be followers, 
and thus, in the course of time, we can hope to put inflated business and its fellow, depressed business, into a class with smallpox, that is, into the class of preventable diseases. It is perfectly possible, with the reorganization of business and finance that is bound to come about, to take the ill effect of seasons, if not the seasons, out of industry, and also the periodic depressions. Farming is already in process of reorganization. When industry and farming are fully reorganized, they will be complementary. They belong together, not apart. As an indication, take our valve plant. We established it 18 miles out in the country, so that the workers could also be farmers. By the use of machinery, farming need not consume more than a fraction of the time it now consumes. The time nature requires to produce is much larger than that required for the human contribution of seeding, cultivating, and harvesting. In many industries where the parts are not bulky, it does not make much difference where they are made. By the aid of water power, they can well be made out in farming country. Thus we can, to a much larger degree than is commonly known, have farmer industrialists who both farm and work under the most scientific and healthful conditions. That arrangement will care for some seasonal industries. Others can arrange a succession of products according to the seasons and the equipment, and still others can, with more careful management, iron out their seasons. A complete study of any specific problem will show the way. The periodic depressions are more serious because they seem so vast as to be uncontrollable. Until the whole reorganization is brought about, they cannot be wholly controlled, but each man in business can easily do something for himself while benefiting his own organization in a very material way. Also help others. The Ford production has not reflected good times or bad times, it has kept right on, regardless of conditions, excepting from 1917 to 1919, when the factory was turned over to war work. The year 1912 to 1913 was supposed to be a dull one, although now some call it normal. We all but doubled our sales. 1913 to 1914 was dull. We increased our sales by more than a third. The year 1920 to 1921 is supposed to have been one of the most depressed in history. We sold a million and a quarter cars, or about five times as many as in 1913 to 1914, the normal year. There is no particular secret in it. It is, as is everything else in our business, the inevitable result of the application of a principle which can be applied to any business. We now have a minimum wage of $6 a day paid without reservation. The people are sufficiently used to high wages to make supervision unnecessary. The minimum wage is paid just as soon as a worker has qualified in his production which is a matter that depends upon his own desire to work. We have put our estimate of profits into the wage and are now paying higher wages than during the boom times after the war. But we are, as always, paying them on the basis of work. And that the men do work is evidenced by the fact that, although $6 a day is the minimum wage, about 60% of the workers receive above the minimum. The $6 is not a flat, but a minimum wage. Consider first the fundamentals of prosperity. Progress is not made by pulling off a series of stunts. Each step has to be regulated. A man cannot expect to progress without thinking. Take prosperity. A truly prosperous time is when the largest number of people are getting all they can legitimately eat and wear and are in every sense of the word comfortable. 
It is a degree of the comfort of the people at large, not the size of the manufacturer's bank balance, that evidences prosperity. The function of the manufacturer is to contribute to this comfort. He is an instrument of society, and he can serve society only as he manages his enterprises so as to turn over to the public an increasingly better product at an ever-decreasing price, and at the same time to pay to all those who have a hand in his business an ever-increasing wage, based upon the work they do. In this way, and in this way alone, can a manufacturer or anyone in business justify his existence. We are not much concerned with the statistics and the theories of the economists on the recurring cycles of prosperity and depression. They call the periods when prices are high prosperous. A really prosperous period is not to be judged on the prices that manufacturers are quoting for articles. We are not concerned with combinations of words. If the prices of goods are above the incomes of the people, then get the prices down to the incomes. Ordinarily, business is conceived as starting with a manufacturing process and ending with a consumer. If that consumer does not want to buy what the manufacturer has to sell him and has not the money to buy it, then the manufacturer blames the consumer and says that business is bad. And thus, hitching the cart before the horse, he goes on his way lamenting. Isn't that nonsense? Does the manufacturer exist for the consumer, or does the consumer exist for the manufacturer? If the consumer will not, says he cannot, buy what the manufacturer has to offer, is that the fault of the manufacturer or the consumer, or is nobody at fault? If nobody is at fault, then the manufacturer must go out of business. But what business ever started with the manufacturer and ended with the consumer? Where does the money to make the wheels go round come from? From the consumer, of course, and success in manufacture is based solely upon an ability to serve that consumer to his liking. He may be served by quality, or he may be served by price. He is best served by the highest quality at the lowest price, and any man who can give to the consumer the highest quality at the lowest price is bound to be a leader in business, whatever the kind of an article he makes. There is no getting away from this. Then why flounder around waiting for good business? Get the cost down by better management. Get the prices down to the buying power. Cutting wages is the easiest and most slovenly way to handle the situation, not to speak of it being an inhuman way. It is, in effect, throwing upon labor the incompetency of the managers of the business. If we only knew it, every depression is a challenge to every manufacturer to put more brains into his business. To overcome by management what other people try to overcome by wage reduction. To tamper with wages before all else is changed is to evade the real issue. And if the real issue is tackled first, no reduction of wages may be necessary. That has been my experience. The immediate practical point is that, in the process of adjustment, someone will have to take a loss, and who can take a loss except those who have something which they can afford to lose? But the expression, take a loss, is rather misleading. Really, no loss is taken at all. It is only a giving up of a certain part of the past profits in order to gain more in the future. I was talking not long since with a hardware merchant in a small town. He said, I expect to take a loss of $10,000 on my stock. But of course, you know, it isn't really like losing that much. 
We hardware men have had pretty good times. Most of my stock was bought at high prices, but I have already sold several stocks and had the benefit of them. Besides, the $10,000 which I say I will lose are not the same kind of dollars that I used to have. They are, in a way, speculative dollars. They are not the good dollars that bought 100 cents worth. So, though my loss may sound big, it is not big. And at the same time I am making it possible for the people in my town to go on building their houses without being discouraged by the size of the hardware item. He is a wise merchant. He would rather take less profit and keep business moving than keep his stock at high prices and bar the progress of his community. A man like that is an asset to a town. He has a clear head. He is better able to swing the adjustment through his inventory than through cutting down the wages of his delivery men through cutting down their ability to buy. He did not sit around holding on to his prices and waiting for something to turn up. He realized what seems to have been quite generally forgotten, that it is part of proprietorship every now and again to lose money. We had to take our loss. Our sales eventually fell off as all other sales fell off. We had a large inventory and, taking the materials and parts in that inventory at their cost price, we could not turn out a car at a price lower than we were asking. But that was a price which, on the turn of business, was higher than people could or wanted to pay. We closed down to get our bearings. We were faced with making a cut of $17 million dollars, in the inventory or taking a much larger loss than that by not doing business. So there was no choice at all. That is always the choice that a man in business has. He can take the direct loss on his books and go ahead and do business, or he can stop doing business and take the loss of idleness. The loss of not doing business is commonly a loss greater than the actual money involved, for during the period of idleness, fear will consume initiative, and, if the shutdown is long enough, there will be no energy left over to start up with again. There is no use waiting around for business to improve. If a manufacturer wants to perform his function, he must get his price down to what people will pay. There is always no matter what the condition, a price that people can and will pay for a necessity, and always, if the will is there, that price can be met. It cannot be met by lowering quality or by short-sighted economy, which results only in a dissatisfied working force. It cannot be met by fussing or buzzing around. It can be met only by increasing the efficiency of production and, viewed in this fashion, each business depression, so called, ought to be regarded as a challenge to the brains of the business community. Concentrating on prices instead of on service is a sure indication of the kind of businessman who can give no justification for his existence as a proprietor. This is only another way of saying that sales should be made on the natural basis of real value, which is the cost of transmuting human energy into articles of trade and commerce. But that simple formula is not considered businesslike. It is not complex enough. We have business which takes the most honest of all human activities and makes them subject to the speculative shrewdness of men who can produce false shortages of food and other commodities and thus excite in society anxiety of demand. We have false stimulation and then false numbness. Economic justice is being constantly and quite often innocently violated. You may say 
that it is the economic condition which makes mankind what it is, or you may say that it is mankind that makes the economic condition what it is. You will find many claiming that it is the economic system which makes men what they are. They blame our industrial system for all the faults which we behold in mankind generally. And you will find other men who say that man creates his own conditions, that if the economic, industrial, or social system is bad, it is but a reflection of what man himself is. What is wrong in our industrial system is a reflection of what is wrong in man himself. Manufacturers hesitate to admit that the mistakes of the present industrial methods are, in part at least, their own mistakes, systematized and extended. But take the question outside of a man's immediate concerns, and he sees the point readily enough. No doubt, with a less faulty human nature, a less faulty social system would have grown up, or, if human nature were worse than it is, a worse system would have grown up though probably a worse system would not have lasted as long as the present one has. But few will claim that mankind deliberately set out to create a faulty social system, granting without reserve that all faults of the social system are in man himself. It does not follow that he deliberately organized his imperfections and established them we shall have to charge a great deal up to ignorance. We shall have to charge a great deal up to innocence. Take the beginnings of our present industrial system. There was no indication of how it would grow. Every new advance was hailed with joy. No one ever thought of capital and labor as hostile interests. No one ever dreamed that the very fact of success would bring insidious dangers with it. And yet with growth, every imperfection latent in the system came out. A man's business grew to such proportions that he had to have more helpers than he knew by their first names. But that fact was not regretted. It was rather hailed with joy. And yet it has since led to an impersonal system wherein the workman has become something less than a person, a mere part of the system. No one believes, of course, that this dehumanizing process was deliberately invented. It just grew. It was latent in the whole early system, but no one saw it, and no one could foresee it. Only prodigious and unheard-of development could bring it to light. Take the industrial idea. What is it? The true industrial idea is not to make money. The industrial idea is to express a serviceable idea, to duplicate a useful idea by as many thousands as there are people who need it. To produce, produce. To get a system that will reduce production to a fine art. To put production on such a basis as will provide means for expansion and the building of still more shops, the production of still more thousands of useful things, that is the real industrial idea. The negation of the industrial idea is the effort to make a profit out of speculation instead of out of work. There are short-sighted men who cannot see that business is bigger than any one man's interests. Business is a process of give and take, live and let live. It is cooperation among many forces and interests. Whenever you find a man who believes that business is a river whose beneficial flow ought to stop as soon as it reaches him, you find a man who thinks he can keep business alive by stopping its circulation. He would produce wealth by this stopping of the production of wealth. The principles of service cannot fail to cure bad business, which leads us into the practical application of the principles of service and finance. End of chapter 9
of My Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010. My Life and Work by Henry Ford in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 10. How Cheaply Can Things Be Made? No one will deny that if prices are sufficiently low, buyers will always be found, no matter what are supposed to be the business conditions. That is one of the elemental facts of business. Sometimes, raw materials will not move, no matter how low the price. We have seen something of that during the last year, but that is because the manufacturers and the distributors were trying to dispose of high-cost stocks before making new engagements. The markets were stagnant, but not saturated with goods. What is called a saturated market is only one in which the prices are above the purchasing power. Unduly high prices are always a sign of unsound business, because they are always due to some abnormal condition. A healthy patient has a normal temperature. A healthy market has normal prices. High prices come about commonly by reason of speculation following the report of a shortage. Although there is never a shortage in everything, a shortage in just a few important commodities or even in one, serves to start speculation. Or, again, goods may not be short at all. An inflation of currency or credit will cause a quick bulge in apparent buying power and the consequent opportunity to speculate. There may be a combination of actual shortages and a currency inflation, as frequently happens during war. But in any condition of unduly high prices, no matter what the real cause, the people pay the high prices because they think there is going to be a shortage. They may buy bread ahead of their own needs, so as not to be left later in the lurch, or they may buy in the hope of reselling at a profit. When there was talk of a sugar shortage, Housewives who never in their lives bought more than 10 pounds of sugar at once tried to get stocks of 100 or 200 pounds, and while they were doing this, speculators were buying sugar to store in warehouses. Nearly all our war shortages were caused by speculation or buying ahead of need. No matter how short the supply of an article is supposed to be, no matter if the government takes control and seizes every ounce of that article, a man who is willing to pay the money can always get whatever supply he is willing to pay for. No one ever knows actually how great or how small is the national stock of any commodity. The very best figures are not more than guesses. Estimates of the world stock of a commodity are still wilder. We may think we know how much of a commodity is produced on a certain day or in a certain month, but that does not tell us how much will be produced the next day or the next month. Likewise, we do not know how much is consumed. By spending a great deal of money we might, in the course of time, get at fairly accurate figures on how much of a particular commodity was consumed over a period, but by the time those figures were compiled, they would be utterly useless, except for historical purposes, because in the next period the consumption might be double or half as much. People do not stay put. That is the trouble with all the framers of the socialistic and communistic and of all other plans for the ideal regulation of society. They all presume that people will stay put. The reactionary has the same idea. He insists that everyone ought to stay put. Nobody does, 
and for that I am thankful. Consumption varies according to the price and the quality, and nobody knows or can figure out what future consumption will amount to, because every time a price is lowered, a new stratum of buying power is reached. Everyone knows that, but many refuse to recognize it by their acts. When a storekeeper buys goods at a wrong price and finds they will not move, he reduces the price by degrees until they do move. If he is wise, instead of nibbling at the price and encouraging in his customers the hopes of even lower prices, he takes a great big bite out of the price and gets the stuff out of his place. Everyone takes a loss on some proposition of sales. The common hope is that after the loss, there may be a big profit to make up for the loss. That is usually a delusion. The profit out of which the loss has to be taken must be found in the business preceding the cut. Anyone who was foolish enough to regard the high profits of the boom period as permanent profits got into financial trouble when the drop came. However, there is a belief, and a very strong one, that business consists of a series of profits and losses, and good business is one in which the profits exceed the losses. Therefore, some men reason that the best price to sell at is the highest price which might be had. That is supposed to be good business practice. Is it? We have not found so. We have found in buying materials that it is not worth while to buy for other than immediate needs. We buy only enough to fit into the plan of production, taking into consideration the state of transportation at the time. If transportation were perfect, and an even flow of materials could be assured, it would not be necessary to carry any stock whatsoever. The carload of raw materials would arrive on schedule and in the planned order and amounts, and go from the railway cars into production. That would save a great deal of money, for it would give a very rapid turnover and thus decrease the amount of money tied up in materials. With bad transportation, one has to carry larger stocks. At the time of revaluing the inventory in 1921, the stock was unduly high because transportation had been so bad. But we learned long ago never to buy ahead for speculative purposes. When prices are going up, it is considered good business to buy far ahead, and when prices are up, to buy as little as possible. It needs no argument to demonstrate that, if you buy materials at 10 cents a pound and the material goes later to 20 cents a pound, you will have a distinct advantage over the man who is compelled to buy at 20 cents. But we have found that thus buying ahead does not pay. It is entering into a guessing contest. It is not business. If a man buys a large stock at 10 cents, he is in a fine position as long as the other man is paying 20 cents. Then he later gets a chance to buy more of the material at 20 cents, and it seems to be a good buy because everything points to the price going to 30 cents. Having great satisfaction in his previous judgment, on which he made money, he of course makes the new purchase. Then the price drops, and he is just where he started. We have carefully figured, over the years, that buying ahead of requirements does not pay, that the gains on one purchase will be offset by the losses on another, and, in the end, we have gone to a great deal of trouble without any corresponding benefit. Therefore, in our buying, we simply get the best price we can for the quantity that we require. We do not buy less if the price be high, and we do not buy more if the price be low. 
we carefully avoid bargain lots in excess of requirements. It was not easy to reach that decision, but in the end, speculation will kill any manufacturer. Give him a couple of good purchases on which he makes money, and before long, he will be thinking about making money out of buying and selling than out of his legitimate business, and he will smash. The only way to keep out of trouble is to buy what one needs, no more and no less. That course removes one hazard from business. This buying experience is given at length because it explains our selling policy. Instead of giving attention to competitors or to demand, our prices are based on an estimate of what the largest possible number of people will want to pay, or can pay, for what we have to sell. And what has resulted from that policy is best evidenced by comparing the price of the touring car and the production. Year, Price, Production 1909-10, to 10, $950, 18,664 cars. 1910 to 11, $780, 34,528 cars. 1911 to 12, $690, 78,440 cars. 1912 to 13, $600, 168,220 cars. 1913 to 14, $550, 248,307 cars. 1914 to 15, $490, 308,213 cars. 1915 to 16, $440, 533,921 cars, 1916 to 17, $360, 785,432 cars, 1917 to 18, $450, 706,000 Five hundred eighty four cars, nineteen eighteen to nineteen, five hundred twenty five dollars, five hundred thirty three thousand seven hundred six cars. The above two years were war years, and the factory was in war work. Nineteen nineteen to twenty, five hundred seventy five dollars to four hundred forty dollars. 996,660 cars, 1920 to 21, $440 to $355, 1,250,000 cars. The high prices of 1921 were, considering the financial inflation, not really high. At the time of writing, the price is $497. These prices are actually lower than they appear to be, because improvements in quality are being steadily made. We study every car in order to discover if it has features that might be developed and adapted. If anyone has anything better than we have, we want to know it. And for that reason, we buy one of every new car that comes out. Usually the car is used for a while, put through a road test, taken apart, and studied as to how and of what everything is made. Scattered about Dearborn, there is probably one of every make of car on earth. Every little while, when we buy a new car, it gets into the newspapers and somebody remarks that Ford doesn't use the Ford. Last year we ordered a big Lanchester, which is supposed to be the best car in England. It lay in our Long Island factory for several months 
and then I decided to drive it to Detroit. There were several of us, and we had a little caravan, the Lanchester, a Packard, and a Ford or two. I happened to be riding in the Lanchester, passing through a New York town, and when the reporters came up, they wanted to know right away why I was not riding in a Ford. Well, you see, it is this way, I answered. I am on a vacation now. I am in no hurry. We do not care much when we get home. That is the reason I am not in the Ford. You know, we also have a line of Ford stories. Our policy is to reduce the price, extend the operations, and improve the article. You will notice that the reduction of price comes first. We have never considered any costs as fixed. Therefore, we first reduce the price to a point where we believe more sales will result. Then we go ahead and try to make the price. We do not bother about the costs. The new price forces the costs down. The more usual way is to take the costs and then determine the price. And although that method may be scientific in the narrow sense, it is not scientific in the broad sense. Because what earthly use is it to know the cost if it tells you you cannot manufacture at a price at which the article can be sold? But more to the point is the fact that, although one may calculate what a cost is, and of course all of our costs are carefully calculated, no one knows what a cost ought to be. One of the ways of discovering what a cost ought to be is to name a price so low as to force everybody in the place to the highest point of efficiency. The low price makes everybody dig for profits. We make more discoveries concerning manufacturing and selling under this forced method than by any method of leisurely investigation. The payment of high wages fortunately contributes to the low costs because the men become steadily more efficient on account of being relieved of outside worries. The payment of five dollars a day for an eight-hour day was one of the finest cost-cutting moves we ever made, and the six-dollar day wage is cheaper than the five. How far this will go, we do not know. We have always made a profit at the prices we have fixed, and, just as we have no idea how high wages will go, we also have no idea how low prices will go, but there is no particular use in bothering on that point. The tractor, for instance, was first sold for $750, then at $850, then at $625, and the other day we cut it 37% to $395. The tractor is not made in connection with the automobiles. No plant is large enough to make two articles. A shop has to be devoted to exactly one product in order to get the real economies. For most purposes, a man with a machine is better than a man without a machine. By the order of design of product and of manufacturing process, we were able to provide that kind of a machine which most multiplies the power of the hand and therefore we give to that man a larger role of service, which means that he is entitled to a larger share of comfort. Keeping that principle in mind, we can attack waste with a definite objective. We will not put into our establishment anything that is useless. We will not put up elaborate buildings as monuments to our success. The interest on the investment and the cost of their upkeep will only serve to add uselessly to the cost of what is produced. So these monuments of success are apt to end as tombs. A great administration building may be necessary. In me, it arouses a suspicion that perhaps there is too much administration. 
we have never found a need for elaborate administration and would prefer to be advertised by our product than where we make our product. The standardization that affects large economies for the consumer results in profits of such gross magnitude to the producer that he can scarcely know what to do with his money. But his effort must be sincere, painstaking, and fearless. Cutting out a half a dozen models is not standardizing. It may be, and usually is, only the limiting of business. For if one is selling on the ordinary basis of profit, that is, on the basis of taking as much money away from the consumer as he will give up, then surely the consumer ought to have a wide range of choice. Standardization, then, is the final stage of the process. We start with consumer, work back through the design, and finally arrive at manufacturing. The manufacturing becomes a means to the end of service. It is important to bear this order in mind. As yet, the order is not thoroughly understood. The price relation is not understood. The notion persists that prices ought to be kept up. On the contrary, good business, large consumption, depends on their going down. And here is another point. The service must be the best you can give. It is considered good manufacturing practice and not bad ethics occasionally to change designs so that old models will become obsolete and new ones will have to be bought either because repair parts for the old cannot be had or because the new model offers a new sales argument which can be used to persuade a consumer to scrap what he has and buy something new. We have been told that this is good business, that it is clever business, that the object of business ought to be to get people to buy frequently, and that it is bad business to try to make anything that will last forever, because when once a man is sold, he will not buy again. Our principle of business is precisely to the contrary. We cannot conceive how to serve a consumer unless we make for him something that, as far as we can provide, will last forever. We want to construct some kind of a machine that will last forever. It does not please us to have a buyer's car wear out or become obsolete. We want the man who buys one of our products never to have to buy another. We never make an improvement that renders any previous model obsolete. The parts of a specific model are not only interchangeable with all other cars of that model, but they are interchangeable with similar parts on all the cars that we have turned out. You can take a car of 10 years ago and, buying today's parts, make it with very little expense into a car of today. Having these objectives, the costs always come down under pressure. And since we have the firm policy of steady price reduction, there is always pressure. Sometimes it is just harder. Take a few more instances of saving. The sweepings net $600,000 a year. Experiments are constantly going on in the utilization of scrap. In one of the stamping operations, six-inch circles of sheet metal are cut out. These formerly went into scrap. The waste worried the men. They worked to find uses for the discs. They found that the plates were just the right size and shape to stamp into radiator caps, but the metal was not thick enough. They tried a double thickness of plates, with the result that they made a cap which tests proved to be stronger than one made out of a single sheet of metal. We get 150,000 of those discs a day. We have now found a use for about 20,000 a day 
and expect to find further uses for the remainder. We saved about $10 each by making transmissions instead of buying them. We experimented with bolts and produced a special bolt made on what is called an upsetting machine with a rolled thread that was stronger than any bolt we could buy, although in its making was used only about one-third of the material that the outside manufacturers used. The saving on one style of bolt alone amounted to half a million dollars a year. We used to assemble our cars at Detroit, and although by special packing we managed to get five or six into a freight car, we needed many hundreds of freight cars a day. Trains were moving in and out all the time. Once, a thousand freight cars were packed in a single day. A certain amount of congestion was inevitable. It is very expensive to knock down machines and crate them so they cannot be injured in transit. To say nothing of the transportation charges, now we assemble only three or four hundred cars a day at Detroit, just enough for local needs. We now ship the parts to our assembling stations all over the United States, and in fact, pretty much all over the world, and the machines are put together there. Wherever it is possible for a branch to make a part more cheaply than we can make in Detroit and ship it to them, then the branch makes the part. The plant at Manchester, England, is making nearly an entire car. The tractor plant at Cork, Ireland, is making almost a complete tractor. This is an enormous saving of expense and is only an indication of what may be done throughout industry generally. When each part of a composite article is made at the exact point where it may be made most economically, we are constantly experimenting with every material that enters into the car. We cut most of our own lumber from our own forests. We are experimenting in the manufacture of artificial leather because we use about 40,000 yards of artificial leather a day. A penny here and a penny there runs into large amounts in the course of a year. The greatest development of all however, is the River Rouge plant, which, when it is running to its full capacity, will cut deeply and in many directions into the price of everything we make. The whole tractor plant is now there. This plant is located on the river on the outskirts of Detroit, and the property covers 665 acres, enough for future development. It has a large slip, and a turning basin capable of accommodating any lake steamship. A short-cut canal and some dredging will give a direct lake connection by way of the Detroit River. We use a great deal of coal. The coal comes directly from our mines over the Detroit, Toledo, and Ironton Railway, which we control, to the Highland Park plant and the River Rouge plant, Part of it goes for steam purposes. Another part goes to the by-product coke ovens, which we have established at the River Rouge plant. Coke moves on from the ovens by mechanical transmission to the blast furnaces. The low volatile gases from the blast furnaces are piped to the power plant boilers, where they are joined by the sawdust and the shavings from the body plant. The making of all our bodies has been shifted to this plant. In addition, the coke breeze, the dust in making of coke, is now also being utilized for stoking. The steam power plant is thus fired almost exclusively from what would otherwise be waste products. Immense steam turbines, directly coupled with dynamos, transform this power into electricity and all of the machinery in the tractor and the body plants 
is run by individual motors from this electricity. In the course of time, it is expected that there will be sufficient electricity to run practically the whole Highland Park plant, and we shall then have to cut our coal bill. Among the by-products of the coke ovens is a gas. It is piped both to the Rouge and Highland Park plants, where it is used for heat-treat purposes, for the enameling ovens, for the car ovens, and the like. We formerly had to buy this gas. The ammonium sulfate is used for fertilizer. The benzol is a motor fuel. The small sizes of coke, not suitable for the blast furnaces, are sold to the employees, delivered free into their homes at much less than the ordinary market price. The largest size coke goes to the blast furnaces. There is no manual handling. We run the melted iron directly from the blast furnaces into great ladles. These ladles travel into the shops, and the iron is poured directly into the molds, without another heating. We thus not only get a uniform quality of iron according to our own specifications, and directly under our control, but we save a melting of pig iron, and in fact, cut out a whole process in manufacturing as well as making available all our own scrap. What all this will amount to in point of savings we do not know. That is, we do not know how great will be the saving, because the plant has not been running long enough to give more than an indication of what is ahead. And we save in so many directions in transportation, in the generation of our power, in the generation of gas, in the expense, in casting. And then over and above, that is the revenue from the by-products and from the smaller sizes of coke. The investment to accomplish these objectives to date amounts to something over $40 million dollars. How far we shall thus reach back to sources depends entirely on circumstances. Nobody anywhere can really do more than guess about the future costs of production. It is wiser to recognize that the future holds more than the past, that every day holds within it an improvement on the methods of the day before. But how about production? If every necessary of life were produced so cheaply and in such quantities, would not the world shortly be surfeited with goods? Will there not come a point when, regardless of price, people simply will not want anything more than what they already have? And if in the process of manufacturing fewer and fewer men are used, what is going to become of these men? How are they going to find jobs and live? Take the second point first. We mention many machines and many methods that displaced great numbers of men, and then someone asks, Yes, that is a very fine idea from the standpoint of the proprietor, but how about these poor fellows whose jobs are taken away from them? The question is entirely reasonable but it is a little curious that it should be asked. For when were men ever really put out of work by the bettering of industrial processes? The stagecoach drivers lost their jobs with the coming of the railways. Should we have prohibited the railways and kept the stagecoach drivers? Were there more men working with the stagecoaches than are working on the railways? Should we have prevented the taxicab because its coming took the bread out of the mouths of the horse cab drivers? How does the number of taxicabs compare with the number of horse cabs when the latter were in their prime? The coming of shoe machinery closed most of the shops of those who made shoes by hand. When shoes were made by hand, only the very well-to-do could own more than a single pair of shoes. And most working people went barefooted in summer. Now, 
Hardly anyone has only one pair of shoes, and shoemaking is a great industry. No, every time you can so arrange that one man will do the work of two, you so add to the wealth of the country that there will be a new and better job for the man who is displaced. If whole industries changed overnight, then disposing of the surplus men would be a problem, but these changes do not occur as rapidly as that. They come gradually. In our own experience, a new place always opens for a man as soon as better processes have taken his old job. And what happens in my shops happens everywhere in industry. There are many times more men today employed in the steel industries than there were in the days when every operation was by hand. It has to be so. It always is so and always will be so. And if any man cannot see it, it is because he will not look beyond his own nose. Now as to saturation, we are continually asked, when will you get to the point of overproduction? When will there be more cars than people to use them? We believe it is possible some day to reach the point where all goods are produced so cheaply and in such quantities that overproduction will be a reality. But as far as we are concerned, we do not look forward to that condition with fear. We look forward to it with great satisfaction. Nothing could be more splendid than a world in which everybody has all that he wants. Our fear is that this condition will be too long postponed. As to our own products, that condition is very far away. We do not know how many motor cars a family will desire to use of the particular kind that we make. We know that, as the price has come down, the farmer, who at first used one car, and it must be remembered that it is not so very long ago that the farm market for motor cars was absolutely unknown, the limit of sales was at that time fixed by all the wise statistical sharps at somewhere near the number of millionaires in the country, now often uses two, and also he buys a truck. Perhaps, instead of sending workmen out to scatter jobs in a single car, it will be cheaper to send each worker out in a car of his own. That is happening with salesmen. The public finds its own consumptive needs with unerring accuracy, and since we no longer make motor cars or tractors, but merely the parts which then assembled become motor cars and tractors, the facilities as now provided would hardly be sufficient to provide replacements for 10 million cars, and it would be quite the same with any business. We do not have to bother about overproduction for some years to come, provided the prices are right. It is the refusal of people to buy on account of price that really stimulates real business. Then, if we want to do business, we have to get the prices down without hurting the quality. Thus, price reduction forces us to learn improved and less wasteful methods of production. One big part of the discovery is what normal in industry depends on managerial genius discovering better ways of doing things. If a man reduces his selling price to a point where he is making no profit or incurring a loss, then he simply is forced to discover how to make as good an article by a better method, making his new method produce the profit and not producing a profit out of reduced wages or increased prices to the public. It is not good management to take profits out of the workers or the buyers. Make management produce the profits. Don't cheapen the product. Don't cheapen the wage. Don't overcharge the public. Put brains into the method and more brains and still more brains 
do things better than ever before, and by this means all parties to business are served and benefited. And all of this can always be done. End of chapter 10《11 of My Life and Work》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2010.《My Life and Work》by Henry Ford, in collaboration with Samuel Crowther. Chapter 11 Money and Goods. The primary object of a manufacturing business is to produce, and if that objective is always kept, finance becomes a wholly secondary matter that has largely to do with bookkeeping. My own financial operations have been very simple. I started with the policy of buying and selling for cash, keeping a large fund of cash always on hand, taking full advantage of all discounts, and collecting interest on bank balances. I regard a bank principally as a place in which it is safe and convenient to keep money. The minutes we spend on a competitor's business, we lose on our own. The minutes we spend in becoming expert in finance, we lose in production. The place to finance a manufacturing business is the shop and not the bank. I would not say that a man in business needs to know nothing at all about finance, but he is better off knowing too little than too much, for if he becomes too expert, he will get into the way of thinking that he can borrow money instead of earning it, and then he will borrow more money to pay back what he has borrowed, and instead of being a businessman, he will be a note juggler, trying to keep in the air a regular flock of bonds and notes. If he is a really expert juggler, he may keep going quite a long time in this fashion, but some day he is bound to make a miss, and the whole collection will come tumbling down around him. Manufacturing is not to be confused with banking, and I think that there is a tendency for too many businessmen to mix up in banking and for too many bankers to mix up in business. The tendency is to distort the true purposes of both business and banking, and that hurts both of them. The money has to come out of the shop, not out of the bank, and I have found that the shop will never answer every possible requirement, and in one case, when it was believed that the company was rather seriously in need of funds, the shop, when called on, raised a larger sum than any bank in this country could loan. We have been thrown into finance, mostly on the way of denial. Some years back, we had to keep standing a denial that the Ford Motor Company was owned by the Standard Oil Company, and with that denial, for convenience's sake, we coupled a denial that we were connected with any other concern or that we intended to sell cars by mail. Last year, the best-liked rumor was that we were down in Wall Street hunting for money. I did not bother to deny that. It takes too much time to deny everything. Instead, we demonstrated that we did not need any money. Since then, I have heard nothing more about being financed by Wall Street. We are not against borrowing money, and we are not against bankers. We are against trying to make borrowed money take the place of work. We are against the kind of banker who regards a business as a melon to be cut. The thing is to keep money and borrowing and finance generally in their proper place, and in order to do that, one has to consider exactly for what the money is needed and how much it is going to be paid off. Money is only a tool in business, 
it is just part of the machinery. You might as well borrow 100,000 lathes as $100,000 if the trouble is inside your business. More lathes will not cure it. Neither will more money. Only heavier doses of brains and thought and wise courage can cure. A business that misuses what it has will continue to misuse what it can get. The point is, cure the misuse. When that is done, the business will begin to make its own money, just as a repaired human body begins to make sufficient pure blood. Borrowing may easily become an excuse for not boring into the trouble. Borrowing may easily become a sop for laziness and pride. Some businessmen are too lazy to get into overalls and go down to see what is the matter. Or they are too proud to permit the thought that anything they have originated could go wrong. But the laws of business are like the law of gravity and the man who opposes them feels their power. Borrowing for expansion is one thing. Borrowing to make up for mismanagement and waste is quite another. You do not want money for the latter. For the reason that money cannot do the job. Waste is corrected by economy. Mismanagement is corrected by brains. Neither of these correctives has anything to do with money. Indeed, money under certain circumstances is their enemy, and many a businessman thanks his stars for the pinch which showed him that his best capital was in his own brains and not in bank loans. Borrowing under circumstances is just like a drunkard taking another drink to cure the effect of the last one. It does not do what it is expected to do, it simply increases the difficulty. Tightening up the loose places in a business is much more profitable than any amount of new capital at 7%. The internal ailments of business are the ones that require most attention. Business, in the sense of trading with the people, is largely a matter of filling the wants of the people. If you make what they need, and sell it at a price which makes possession a help and not a hardship, then you will do business as long as there is business to do. People buy what helps them just as naturally as they drink water. But the process of making the article will require constant care. Machinery wears out and needs to be restored. Men grow uppish, lazy, or careless. A business is men, and machines united in the production of a commodity, and both the man and the machines need repairs and replacements. Sometimes it is the men higher up who most need revamping, and they themselves are always the last to recognize it. When a business becomes congested with bad methods, when a business becomes ill through lack of attention to one or more of its functions, when executives sit comfortably back in their chairs as if the plans they inaugurated are going to keep them going forever, when business becomes a mere plantation on which to live and not a big work which one has to do, then you may expect trouble. You will wake up some fine morning and find yourself doing more business than you have ever done before, and getting less out of it. You will find yourself short of money. You can borrow money, and you can do it oh so easily. People will crowd money on you. It is the most subtle temptation the young businessman has. But if you do borrow money, you are simply giving a stimulant to whatever may be wrong. You feed the disease. Is a man more wise with borrowed money than he is with his own? Not as a usual thing. To borrow under such conditions is to mortgage a declining property. The time for a businessman to borrow money, if ever, is when he does not need it. That is, when he does not need it as a substitute for the things he ought himself to do. 
If a man's business is in excellent condition and in need of expansion, it is comparatively safe to borrow. But if a business is in need of money through mismanagement, then the thing to do is to get into the business and correct the trouble from the inside, not poultice it with loans from the outside. My financial policy is the result of my sales policy. I hold that it is better to sell a large number of articles at a small profit than to sell a few at a large profit. This enables a larger number of people to buy, and it gives a larger number of men employment at good wages. It permits the planning of production, the elimination of dull seasons, and the waste of carrying an idle plan. Thus results a suitable, continuous business, and if you will think it over, you will discover that most so-called urgent financing is made necessary because of a lack of planned, continuous business. Reducing prices is taken by the short-sighted to be the same as reducing the income of a business. It is very difficult to deal with that sort of a mind because it is so totally lacking in even the background knowledge of what business is. For instance, I was once asked, when contemplating a reduction of $80 a car, whether on a production of 500,000 cars, this would not reduce the income of the company by $40 million. Of course, if one sold only 500,000 cars at the new price, the income would be reduced $40 million, which is an interesting mathematical calculation that has nothing whatsoever to do with business, because unless you reduce the price of an article, the sales do not continuously increase, and therefore the business has no stability. If a business is not increasing, it is bound to be decreasing, and a decreasing business always needs a lot of financing. Old-time business went on the doctrine that prices should always be kept up to the highest point at which people will buy. Really modern business has to take the opposite view. Bankers and lawyers can rarely appreciate this fact. They confuse inertia with stability. It is perfectly beyond their comprehension that the price should ever voluntarily be reduced. That is why putting the usual type of banker or lawyer into the management of a business is courting disaster. Reducing prices increases the volume and disposes of finance, provided one regards the inevitable profit as a trust fund with which to conduct more and better business. Our profit, because of the rapidity of the turnover in the business and the great volume of sales, has, no matter what the price at which the product was sold, always been large. We have had a small profit per article, but a large aggregate profit. The profit is not constant. After cutting the prices, the profits for a time run low, but then the inevitable economies begin to get in their work, and the profits go high again. But they are not distributed as dividends. I have always insisted on the payment of small dividends, and the company has today no stockholders who wanted a different policy. I regard business profits above a small percentage as belonging more to the business than to the stockholders. The stockholders, to my way of thinking, ought to be only those who are active in the business and who will regard the company as an instrument of service rather than as a machine for making money. If large profits are made and working to serve forces them to be large, then they should be in part turn back into the business so that it may be still better fitted to serve and in part passed on to the purchaser. During one year our profits were so much larger than we expected them to be 
that we voluntarily return fifty dollars to each purchaser of a car. We felt that unwittingly we had overcharged the purchaser by that much. My price policy, and hence my financial policy, came up in a suit brought against the company several years ago to compel the payment of larger dividends. On the witness stand, I gave the policy then in force, and which is still in force. It is this. In the first place, I hold that it is better to sell a large number of cars at a reasonably small margin than to sell fewer cars at a large margin of profit. I hold this because it enables a large number of people to buy and enjoy the use of a car, and because it gives a larger number of men employment at good wages. Those are aims I have in life, but I would not be counted a success. I would be, in fact, a flat failure if I could not accomplish that and, at the same time, make a fair amount of profit for myself and the men associated with me in business. This policy I hold is good business policy because it works, because with each succeeding year we have been able to put our car within the reach of greater and greater numbers, give employment to more and more men, and, at the same time, through the volume of business, increase our own profits beyond anything we had hoped for or even dreamed of when we started. Bear in mind, every time you reduce the price of the car without reducing the quality, you increase the possible number of purchasers. There are many men who will pay $360 for a car who would not pay 440 We had, in round numbers, 500,000 buyers of cars on the $440 basis, and I figure that on the $360 basis, we can increase the sales to possibly 800,000 cars for the year. Less profit on each car, but more cars, more employment of labor. And in the end, we shall get all the total profit we ought to make. And let me say right here that I do not believe that we should make such an awful profit on our cars. A reasonable profit is right, but not too much. So it has been my policy to force the price of the car down as fast as production would permit, and give the benefits to users and laborers, with resulting surprisingly enormous benefits to ourselves. This policy does not agree with the general opinion that a business is to be managed to the end that stockholders can take out the largest possible amount of cash. Therefore, I do not want stockholders in the ordinary sense of the term. They do not help forward the ability to serve. My ambition is to employ more and more men and to spread, insofar as I am able, the benefits of the industrial system that we are working to found. We want to help build lives and homes. This requires that the largest share of the profits be put back into productive enterprise. Hence, we have no place for the non-working stockholders. The working stockholder is more anxious to increase his opportunity to serve than to bank dividends. If it, at any time, became a question between lowering wages or abolishing dividends, I would abolish dividends. That time is not apt to come, for, as I have pointed out, there is no economy in low wages. It is bad financial policy to reduce wages because it also reduces buying power. If one believes that leadership brings responsibility, then a part of that responsibility is in seeing that those whom one leads shall have an adequate opportunity to earn a living. Finance concerns not merely the profit or solvency of a company. 
It also comprehends the amount of money that the company turns back to the community through wages. There is no charity in this. There is no charity in proper wages. It is simply that no company can be said to be stable which is not so well managed that it can afford a man an opportunity to do a great deal of work and therefore to earn a good wage. There is something sacred about wages. They represent homes and families and domestic destinies. People ought to tread very carefully when approaching wages. On the cost sheet, wages are mere figures. Out in the world, wages are bread boxes and coal bins, babies' cradles and children's education, family comforts and contentment. On the other hand, there is something just as sacred about capital, which is used to provide the means by which work can be made productive. Nobody is helped if our industries are sucked dry of their lifeblood. There is something just as sacred about a shop that employs thousands of men as there is about a home. The shop is the mainstay of all the finer things which the home represents. If we want the home to be happy, we must contrive to keep the shop busy. The whole justification of the profits made by the shop is that they are used to make doubly secure the homes dependent on that shop and to create more jobs for other men. If profits go to swell a personal fortune, that is one thing. If they go to provide a sounder basis for business, better working conditions, better wages, more extended employment, that is quite another thing. Capital thus employed should not be carelessly tampered with. It is for the service of all, though it may be under the direction of one. Profits belong in three places. They belong to the business, to keep it steady, progressive, and sound. They belong to the men, who helped produce them. And they belong also, in part, to the public. A successful business is profitable to all three of these interests, planner, producer, and purchaser. People whose profits are excessive when measured by any sound standard, should be the first to cut prices, but they never are. They pass all their extra costs down the line until the whole burden is borne by the consumer. And besides doing that, they charge the consumer a percentage on the increased charges. Their whole business philosophy is, get while the getting is good. They are the speculators, the exploiters, the no-good element that is always injuring legitimate business. There is nothing to be expected from them. They have no vision. They cannot see beyond their own cash registers. These people can talk more easily about a 10 or 20 percent cut in wages than they can about a 10 or 20 percent cut in profits. But a businessman surveying the whole community in all its interests and wishing to serve that community ought to be able to make his contribution to stability. It has been our policy always to keep on hand a large amount of cash. The cash balance in recent years has usually been in excess of $50 million. This is deposited in banks all over the country. We do not borrow, but we have established lines of credit so that if we so cared, we might raise a very large amount of money by bank borrowing. But keeping the cash reserve makes borrowing unnecessary. Our provision is only to be prepared to meet an emergency. I have no prejudice against proper borrowing. It is merely that I do not want to run the danger of having the control of the business and hence the particular idea of service to which I am devoted taken into other hands. A considerable part of finance 
is in the overcoming of seasonal operation. The flow of money ought to be nearly continuous. One must work steadily in order to work profitably. Shutting down involves great waste. It brings the waste of unemployment of men, the waste of unemployment of equipment, and the waste of restricted future sales through the higher prices of interrupted production. That has been one of the problems we had to meet. We could not manufacture cars to stock during the winter months when purchases are less than in spring or summer. Where or how could any one store half a million cars? And if stored, how could they be shipped in the rush season? And who would find the money to carry such a stock of cars even if they could be stored. Seasonal work is hard on the working force. Good mechanics will not accept jobs that are good for only part of the year. To work in full force, 12 months of the year, guarantees workmen of ability, builds up a permanent manufacturing organization, and continually improves the product. The men in the factory, through uninterrupted service, become more familiar with the operations. The factory must build, the sales department must sell, and the dealer must buy cars all the year through, if each would enjoy the maximum profit to be derived from the business. If the retail buyer will not consider purchasing except in seasons, a campaign of education needs to be waged proving the all-the-year-around value of a car rather than the limited season value. And while the educating is being done, the manufacturer must build and the dealer must buy in anticipation of business. We were the first to meet the problem in the automobile business. The selling of Ford cars is a merchandising proposition. In the days when every car was built to order, and fifty cars a month a big output, it was reasonable to wait for the sale before ordering. The manufacturer waited for the order before building. We very shortly found that we could not do business on order. The factory could not be built large enough, even were it desirable, to make between March and August all the cars that were ordered during those months. Therefore, years ago began the campaign of education to demonstrate that a Ford was not a summer luxury, but a year-round necessity. Coupled with that came the education of the dealer into the knowledge that even if he could not sell so many cars in winter as in summer, it would pay him to stock in winter for the summer, and thus be able to make instant delivery. Both plans have worked out. In most parts of the country, cars are used almost as much in winter as in summer. It has been found that they will run in snow, ice, or mud, in anything. Hence, the winter sales are constantly growing larger and the seasonal demand is in part lifted from the dealer, and he finds it profitable to buy ahead in anticipation of needs. Thus, we have no seasons in the plant. The production, up until the last couple of years, has been continuous, excepting for the annual shutdowns for inventory. We have had an interruption during the period of extreme depression, but it was an interruption made necessary in the process of readjusting ourselves to the market conditions. In order to attain continuous production, and hence a continuous turning over of money, we have had to plan our operations with extreme care. The plan of production is worked out very carefully each month between the sales and production departments with the object of producing enough cars so that those in transit will take care of the orders in hand. Formerly, 
when we assembled and shipped cars, this was of the highest importance, because we had no place in which to store finished cars. Now we ship parts instead of cars and assemble only those required for the Detroit district. That makes the planning no less important, for if the production stream and the order stream are not approximately equal, we should be either jammed with unsold parts or behind in our orders. When you are turning out the parts to make 4,000 cars a day, just a very little carelessness in overestimating orders will pile up a finished inventory running into the millions. That makes the balancing of operations an exceedingly delicate matter. In order to earn the proper profit on our narrow margin, we must have a rapid turnover. We make cars to sell, not to store, and a month's unsold production would turn into a sum the interest on which alone would be enormous. The production is planned a year ahead, and the number of cars to be made in each month of the year is scheduled, for of course it is a big problem to have the raw materials and such parts as we still buy from the outside flowing in consonance with production. We can no more afford to carry large stocks of finished than we can of raw material. Everything has to move in and move out, and we have had some narrow escapes. Some years ago, the plant of the Diamond Manufacturing Company burned down. They were making radiator parts for us and the brass parts, tubings and castings. We had to move quickly or take a big loss. We got together the heads of all our departments, the pattern makers and the draughtsmen. They worked from 24 to 48 hours on a stretch. They made new patterns. The diamond company leased a plant and got some machinery in by express. We furnished the other equipment for them, and in 20 days they were shipping again. We had enough stock on hand to carry us over, say, for seven or eight days, but that fire prevented us shipping cars for ten or fifteen days. Except for our having stock ahead, it would have held us up for twenty days, and our expenses would have gone right on. To repeat, the place in which to finance is the shop. It has never failed us, and once, when it was thought that we were hard up for money, it served rather conclusively to demonstrate how much better finance can be conducted from the inside than from the outside. End of chapter 11